So by now we know a little bit about sleep disordered breathing and obstructive sleep apnea. And here I've drawn a person laying down and you can see their airway extending down into their lungs, which I've drawn here in green. And when this person wants to take a breath or breathe out, we know that the diaphragm contracts, pulling out to either side, and in doing so, pulls air down into the lungs. And we know based on the pathophysiology of sleep disordered breathing that the airway here becomes narrowed. And I'll try and draw this here in black to show the narrowing of the airway, which is normally in this red color. And if air normally comes in kind of down in this direction, flowing smoothly until it hits this block, it can't go any farther. And we know this is a problem because when this person would be sleeping, they wouldn't be able to get enough oxygen into their body. Figuring out who has obstructive sleep apnea can sometimes be a challenge, and fortunately there are a couple different questionnaires we can use to help us along the way. So we're going to go over two of these questionnaires here, and the first one here in red has a really cool name. It's called the Stop Bang Questionnaire. So I'll just write in Stop Bang. And each of these letters in our acronym Stop Bang stands for something, a question that you may ask this patient. So this uh, acronym should help you remember. And this stop bang questionnaire is useful to us because it assesses a patient's risk for sleep apnea. So what do each of these letters stand for? Well, the S stands for snoring. So does this person snore really loudly, maybe even loudly enough to be heard through doors or walls? The T stands for tired. So is this person tired during the day, which would make sense if they keep waking up during the middle of the night? O stands for observed. So has this person been observed to stop breathing during their sleep? And this might be something that could be answered by a sleep partner better than the person themselves. P stands for the P in blood pressure. So does this person have a high blood pressure or uh, are they taking medication to treat high blood pressure? The B here stands for having a BMI greater than 35, which would make any patient with this number be classified as severely obese. And in a severely obese patient, because their neck is so large, it would tend to compress this airway, which would give this person obstructive sleep apnea. The A stands for an age greater than 50, which is another one of these risk factors. The N stands for having a neck greater than 40 centimeters in circumference, which, a lot like the B up here, would indicate having a lot of excess tissue in the neck area, which could tend to compress the airway when the patient was lying down. And the G stands for gender, because men are more likely than women to have obstructive sleep apnea, at least until menopause. So with the stop bang questionnaire, these are all yes or no questions, and you're looking for three or more yeses. And if you get that, this person has an increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea. This questionnaire, though, is not very sensitive or specific. You can imagine it's possible to have three or more yeses and still not have obstructive sleep apnea. And in fact, the likelihood ratio for this test is only 1.5, which isn't that great. And that's why this is a screening tool, not diagnostic. The other questionnaire we're going to be talking about is the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. So I'll just write in Epworth here. And unlike the stop bang questionnaire, the Epworth only measures sleepiness. And it also consists of eight questions, and we'll show those here. But this is scored a little bit differently. You ask the patient for each of these situations how likely they are to doze off. And they're scored on a scale of zero to three. Zero being, no, I don't tend to fall asleep in these situations at all. And three being, yes, I'm very likely to fall asleep in these situations. And of a maximum of 24 points, if the patient ends up with a score of greater than 10, we say they have excessive daytime sleepiness. The only way, though, to definitively determine if someone has obstructive sleep apnea is to do what's called a sleep study. And this gets a special name. It's called polysomnography. And I'll write that here. And when you do the graphs, it looks something like this. And we'll walk through exactly the details of this graph and what it means. Uh, but there's four different types of these respiratory events you might see when you're monitoring someone overnight. And we'll go through each of these four types, obstructive, hypopnea, central, and mixed. So this graph has a lot of lines on it, and they each mean something important. This top line here, this is an EKG, so this is just to monitor the patient's heart. The second line here, this monitors airflow. And when you see this line deflecting upwards, this would be an inhalation, and downward deflections are exhalation. This middle line here, this represents thoracic effort, and what it's actually measuring is the movement of the chest wall. So by telling how much the chest expands, we can get an idea for thoracic effort. The line below it, this is abdominal effort, and it's a similar concept. It measures the movement of the abdomen. And together, thoracic and abdominal effort, these can give us an idea of what the diaphragm is actually doing without measuring directly if it's contracting. And this last line here, this is the 
SAO2, or the oxygen saturation, and you can see it has these little numbers, 96, 94, 97, that just track over time uh, the oxygen saturation of the patient's blood. So the first one we're going to look at here is obstructive sleep apnea, and if we look at this airflow line, we know that upward deflections are inhalations, and downward deflections are exhalations. And this continues normally until we reach this flat part of the curve, the apnea, where we have no airflow. And I'll just block off this region here with these two red lines so we can define more clearly this apnea we're talking about. And it's key here that this lasts for at least 10 seconds. At the same time, though, our thoracic effort continues because the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles continue to work. They just have to try and work harder in order to pass this blockage to get any oxygen into the body. So you can see this, and I'll exaggerate it as I'm drawing here, the lines, this amplitude, gets higher and higher for both of these lines because the body is trying to compensate for the fact that there's an obstruction. It's trying to try harder to pull air down through this obstruction that's not letting air get into the lungs. And this effort will continue to increase until the airway is open again. So let's just clear these lines out of the way here. Another characteristic we have here is that the thoracic and abdominal effort become out of sync. So you can see we have a trough in this thoracic effort line and a peak in this abdominal effort line, which means that they're not working together. Normally you'd like to see peaks over peaks and troughs over troughs, much like you see a trough over a trough here and another trough over a trough here when the airflow is going normally. So this misalignment of the thoracic muscles and the abdominal muscles, this is called paradoxing. So I'll just write that here. Paradoxing. And this is characteristic of what you would see in a patient with obstructive sleep apnea. In the SAO2 line, the oxygen saturation, we would expect it to drop because no air is going into the body between these red lines, and that's exactly what we see. We see it holding steady for a little bit, but then it kind of drops down here from a high of 97 all the way down to a low of 89 and even falling even further before this patient starts to breathe again. So the next respiratory event we're going to be talking about is hypopnea. And let's just go ahead and swap out our graph here. And like we did with obstructive sleep apnea, we'll just walk our way through this graph and the different curves that are here. If an apnea is a complete absence of airflow, a hypopnea is a reduction in airflow, but not to the point that it goes away completely. So if we look at our airflow diagram, we again see inhalations deflecting upward and exhalations deflecting downward. And we suddenly see a drop in the amplitude somewhere in the middle of this graph. And let me go ahead and put some red lines again that will denote the beginning of this event on the left hand side and the end of this event on the right hand side. So you can see between these two red lines the amplitude of this airflow line drops by about 50 percent. When it comes to thoracic and abdominal effort again we see paradoxing. So we see a trough on the thoracic effort line matched up with a peak on the abdominal effort line and vice versa throughout this event. And once it's over, we see the airflow amplitude return back to normal, and the thoracic and abdominal effort paradoxing go away, where we see peak over peak and trough over trough. If we look at the curve for SAO2, we see it doesn't drop very far, from 98 at a peak on the left to about 95 in the middle. And in fact, this is included in the definition of hypopnea, a reduction in airflow of at least 30% that lasts at least 10 seconds, and that's associated with a greater than 3% drop in oxygen to saturation or an arousal on the EEG. The next one we're going to look at is a central apnea. So here we have an apnea because there's no signal getting to the muscles that would allow air to move in and out of the body. We see no effort between here and here, and between this second one and this one. So between these two red lines, we see no effort in the thoracic and abdominal areas, and because of that, we see no airflow. So our airflow amplitude is basically flat throughout this time. So the key here is because there's no effort, there's no flow. The last event we'll talk about here is a mixed apnea. So a mixed apnea has a central component and an obstructive component. And we know it's a complete apnea because if we look at the airflow between here and here, we see that it's completely flat. So there's no airflow in or out. Now if we look at the thoracic and abdominal effort curves, we'll be able to tell the central from the obstructive component. So in the first half of this event, between about here, and here, so I'll just draw this line in between them, we see that our effort is relatively flat in the thoracic and abdominal effort compartments. And this would be characteristic of a central apnea where we have no effort and no flow. But as soon as that's over, and I'll mark the boundaries of that with this purple line here, between about here 
all the way until the end of this event. This would be consistent with an obstructive event because we have gradually increasing amplitude and we have paradoxing, which I'll try and match up with this green arrow here. So we have the trough of the thoracic effort curve matching up with the peak of the abdominal effort curve. And then once this obstruction is cleared, and I'll try and mark that with this black line here, we see a normal return to the amplitude curve, and we see the disappearance of the paradoxing in the thoracic and abdominal effort curves. So if you can diagnose someone with sleep apnea, then it's up to you to do something about it. So here we're going to talk about treatment options. What can you do to make these patients better and improve their quality of life? And there's a few different options we have, and we'll take a look at those here. So the particular treatment you use depends on the cause of the problem. So if the patient happens to be overweight or obese, then the treatment you might seek would be weight loss because anything that can remove the amount of tissue from the neck area would tend to allow the airway to open up while this patient was sleeping and improve their sleep apnea symptoms. If the problem was anatomical, if you had some sort of defect in the airway that had been there since birth or as a result of trauma or something else, then maybe a curative surgery would be the only option where you can go in and surgically widen the airway. Other things people have tried fall under the heading of positional therapy, so trying to teach someone to sleep on their side or even going so far as sewing a golf ball into the back of their shirt so anytime they lay on their back, they're uncomfortable and tend to just roll over, and because of that, they don't develop the airway blockage that would cause sleep apnea in the first place. Another non-invasive therapy would be an oral device. So this would be something like a mouth guard that could tend to push the jaw forward and in doing so widen the airway and allow air to flow normally in and out between the lungs and the outside world. All four of these treatments though are for mild obstructive sleep apnea. To handle the more severe cases we use something called PAP or positive airway pressure. And that would look something like this, where you'd have a PAP machine that would sit next to a patient's bed or on the floor somewhere near where they were sleeping. Uh, the patient would put on a mask that would cover their mouth and nose and would connect to the machine with a hose. So in a normal airway, we have a more or less straight path for the air to go. But in one that's obstructed, we see that this kind of closes down and the air has a much more difficult time forcing through this smaller area than it does passing through this much larger area in the normal airway. The function of PAP is to provide a positive pressure with each breath to help overcome the collapsing airway by pushing the airway out and allowing air to flow more easily back and forth. The mechanics of breathing with PAP are a little different than normal, so it takes a little bit of getting used to for patients, and for those who tolerate it, they usually experience improvement in sleep quality and they're more alert during the day due to the good night's sleep that they're getting. But as good as these patients feel, compliance is unfortunately only in the 60-70% to 70 range over the long term.